and welcome to the United States Geological Survey. I'm pleased to see you all here for our November 21, 2019 public lecture. I'm Diane Garcia and I'm with our Science Information Services. Before we start tonight's presentation, I want to let you know we will not be having a December um, talk, holidays and everything like that, as you can all imagine. But the good news is we will be back in 2020. So please save the date, January 23rd, 2020. And we're going to have Justin Haggerty talk about our, um, a geo <laughs> our Astrogeology Science Center. Ooh, I had to stop and think. Our Astrogeology Science Center out of Flagstaff, Arizona. So like I said, do save the date and come back for that. But tonight's presentation is sea level rise, extreme water levels, and coastal erosion. How bad could it possibly be? And it's going to be presented by Dr. Sean Vitasek. Sean was born and raised in Hawaii. He attended high school at Hawaii Preparatory Academy. And then next he attended Princeton University and majored in civil and environmental engineering. Outside of the classroom, Sean played on the Princeton volleyball team and was the president of the Princeton Surf Club. Sean received his master's in geology and geophysics from the University of Hawaii and was advised by Chip Fletcher. With a strong interest to pursue numerical modeling, he attended Stanford University and obtained his PhD in civil and environmental engineering, where he was advised by Oliver Fringer and supported by the Department of Energy Computational Science Graduate Fellowship. Following his time at Stanford, he received a Mendenhall postdoctoral fellowship here with the United States Geological Survey in Santa Cruz. Sean worked a as a research assistant professor and later as an assistant professor in the Department of Civil and Materials Engineering at the University of Illinois in Chicago. Sean returned to the U.S. Geological Survey, thank God, <laughs> at the end of the government shutdown this year, in 2019, working as a research oceanographer to develop numerical models to predict coastal climate change impacts. In his spare time, him and his wife, Sylvia, enjoy playing with their two-month-old daughter, Marigold, who likes to go swimming and surfing with Daddy. Thanks. Two years. Oh, I'm sorry. I said two months. That was what was on here. Oh. Two years. Two years. Yep. Oh, oh, the fun <laughs> is just beginning. Anyhow, <laughs> sorry about that. Anyhow, <laughs> thank you. Um, let's go ahead and give a warm round of applause and welcome, Sean. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks. Can everybody hear me okay? So much, a little louder? Okay. <laughs> um, well, thanks very much for coming. This talk is about sea level rise, extreme water levels, and coastal erosion. How bad can it possibly be? And the title's a little bit of a joke because, uh, as you can imagine, um, if you get pretty high end sea level rise scenarios, it can be, things can be pretty bad. So, this is the outline for the talk. I'll give a little brief intro on sea level rise, and then I'll talk. The first section of the talk about coastal flooding, extreme waves and water levels, and the second section um, about coastal erosion using a data assimilated model of coastal change in California that we've developed. Um, and to do something fun, um, I decided to associate uh, a movie with each one of these sections. <laughs> so Water World, uh, Point Break, and True Lies. And each of these movies should be consistent with the theme of these talks, and there should be a, a real specific Easter egg uh, associated with each of these movies um, in these sections of the talk. And so while I'm going through and, and presenting about this, you could maybe think about in your mind how, how this movie is relating to this particular section of the talk. <coughs> so, well, Waterworld is, is relatively obvious when you're talking about sea level rise. Um, this is the very introductory scene to Waterworld, and the concept behind the movie Waterworld uh, is that with global warming, um, the ice on the planet melts, 
And so that melting ice raises sea level to the point where there's no more uh, land on the planet. Um, which geologically speaking is, is not uh, entirely correct. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about why that's the case. Um, but I, I think Waterworld was, was really uh, one of my main motivations to study sea level rise. Uh, I actually grew up uh, on the big island of Hawaii. And uh, in Kauai High Harbor here, pretty close to uh, where I lived, um, they built this post-apocalyptic atoll when I was a kid. And we'd have Mexican food down at the harbor when we'd go to the beach. And so when I was a kid going to the beach, we'd drive by um, this thing being built and, and the movie being filmed. And so I think that was probably one of the main motivations for, for why I studied sea level rise as a kid, um, because Waterworld was, was filmed at, right on the Big Island at the same time. Okay. So Waterworld, the, the concept behind that movie is not entirely correct because if you, if you melted all the ice on the planet, um, you'd probably only raise sea level by about 100 meters. So there'd be plenty of land left um, on planet Earth even if you melted all of that ice. However, as you can imagine, the half a meter to uh, two and a half meters um, of sea level rise that we expect uh, in about the next 80 years um, could be pretty significant. And so we want all of that ice to remain as ice for, for as long as possible. So currently, uh, sea level is rising at about three to four millimeters per year. And, and this is very well measured from a network of tide gauges all around the world and from satel satellite altimetry, so satellites that are, that are measuring sea level over time. Um, so that's what sea level is currently rising at. Um, but the question of how much sea level rise are we going to get by 2100 um, is unknown and is one of the most important scientific questions of the 21st century, uh, in my opinion. Uh, so if you go to Google Scholar, uh, which is a great website, and you type in sea level rise projections since 2019, so just this year, you'll get almost uh, 13,000 papers. <laughs> so a lot of papers that have been written on this subject, you know, this is a very important subject and a um, uh, lot of implications, a lot of things that are riding on how much sea level rise we're going to get um, in the next 80 years. So most of these sea level projections uh, range from about a half meter to two and a half meters, and pretty much all of the variability is controlled by how much of the large land-based ice masses, Greenland and Antarctica, are, are going to melt. Um, uh, carbon emissions also, as you can imagine, play, play a big role. You see these two different scenarios, which are sort of a low emissions and a higher emission scenario. But the major uncertainty between the medium range sea level scenarios and the high end is, is just the stability of those, those large ice masses, <coughs> um, as you can see. Um, so my own uh, global mean sea level projection of how much I think we're going to get by that time, uh, based on everything that I've read, is probably about one and a half to two meters of sea level rise. <coughs> and the reason that I wanted to make this projection uh, is because this lecture is being recorded. And so in 2100, when my grandkids watch this lecture on their holographic iPads or their augmented reality goggles, they, they could see how, how far off their, their grandpa's prediction was. But anyway, that's my prediction for, for what we're going to get. Um, and those predictions are are not unreasonable given the large sea level swings that, that the Earth has seen uh, over the past long time. So this is uh, in millions of years before present. Uh, and you can see that sea level um, has swung more than 100 meters um, uh, in the past. Um, and this is all due to uh, orbital motions, the orbit of the, the Sun and the Earth. And um, when we transition from two glacial periods, um, ocean water is occupied more so as ice than, than normal. 
So during the transition to glacial periods, you have about one meter, one millimeter per year of sea level fall, and you have sea level low stands that are about 100 meters lower than present. And then when you transition out of glacial periods to interglacial periods, uh, you have about five millimeters per year of sea level rise. And so interestingly, I, I just put here this um, timeline for at the, at the uh, glacial period um, where the city of Atlantis is built, this ancient civilization. And after that, you can, you can guess what happened to Atlantis. Well, um, sea level rised rapidly from its low stand of about 100 meters um, to, to go away. And so this is kind of a, a half joke of, um, you know, consequences for, for civilizations um, with, with rapidly rising sea levels. So right now, Earth should be in a cooling phase. Um, we're coming out of this interglacial. So we should be getting about one millimeter uh, per year of sea level fall, uh, but that's not what we're seeing. Um, so looking at the sea level impacts, by 2050 to 2100, um, sea level rise could displace about 200 million people. Um, as I'll talk uh, later in this, this section of this talk, um, it could make extreme water levels become uh, the mean, or happen, extreme water levels happen all the time. Uh, it can erode sandy beaches by dozens to hundreds of meters. Uh, and also, um, even if you sort of build a wall to keep all the sea level out, um, you can still have what's called groundwater flooding or groundwater inundation where that uh, higher water table can actually go through the groundwater and, and cause flooding through the ground, even if you have a barrier on, on the coastline. Okay, so that uh, concludes the introduction about sea level rise, and you can see how water world is a, is a very strong connection there. Um, the next section is coastal flooding and extreme waves, and the movie related to that is, is Point Break, so you can think about it in the back of your mind how the movie Point Break, if you've seen it, might relate to, um, to what I'm talking about. Okay, so say we wanted to assess flooding and erosion on a, on a given beach. Uh, what are the processes that we need to consider? So here's a, a few. Um, a very important process uh, is waves. Uh, what are the waves doing? Uh, so waves, uh, when they break, they create uh, a mean sea level elevation that's right near the shore, which is called wave setup. Uh, additionally, on a beach, you have this run-up motion uh, called wave swash back and forth or wave overtopping just from those individual waves that are propagating over the beach. Another important process in, in flooding is, is the tide. Um, high tide versus low tide can, can be a pretty big difference in water level. Um, Another term uh, here, which I'm showing, just these, these are residual terms. For instance, storm surge, um, which is caused by decreases in atmospheric pressure, uh, which cause water level to rise, uh, and also winds. Um, and climatic cycles like uh, El Nino, uh, which in California can elevate uh, mean sea level around California by 10 or 15 centimeters when you have an El Nino year. Uh, and other sea level anomalies like like eddies and things like that can contribute to variation of, of sea level, uh, which you can see in tide gauges. So sea level rise can be um, uh, very important uh, in the range of all these processes because all of these processes essentially contribute to sort of the variability in the water level. But sea level sort of represents the mean. So if you take the mean of that varying water level and you just raise that mean, and then everything's varying about that new mean, the, extre the extreme thresholds where all the infrastructure is built um, can be overtopped more and more easily with lesser and lesser storms, say. And we'll talk a little bit about that later in, in, the, in the talk. Um, OK, so here I'm just showing a, a nice day uh, in Capitola, uh, where there's no waves, there's really nothing going on. Um, and you could see it'd probably be a nice uh, time to go swimming or go to the beach. So this is without waves, and then this is the, the setup with waves, which you can see looks like a, a, a very different place with, with these waves breaking very, very far out to shore. Uh, here you see another uh, example of, of Capitola uh, flooding where you have these big wave events that are sort of coming up and, 
and washing into these little structures uh, here. So uh, pretty, pretty serious um, situation there if you, if you happen to live in one of those places. OK, so how do we characterize um, extreme events like extreme waves and extreme water levels? Um, well, to characterize those, generally you'll use some sort of statistical model. And the most popular statistical model to describe the, the distribution or the occurrence of those extreme events is this model called the, the GEV, the Generalized Extreme Value Distribution. And there's some really nice um, uh, mathematical theory that basically shows that if you take a random variable, any kind of random variable, um, the extremes of that random variable uh, should follow a, a generalized extreme value distribution. So the, here I'm showing an example of, of this is a, a buoy in Hawaii, and you look at a, a wave height record. Uh, and you can generally see big waves in the wintertime, smaller waves in the summertime. And these red circles are, are the top three largest events uh, in a given year. And if you fit those top three events per year for 30 years here to a distribution, um, the GEV distribution generally uh, holds pretty well. Uh, and for engineering design, you can, you can write this in a different way where you look at a return period and you look at wave height where this is the, the one year or annual wave height, this is the 10 year wave height, this is the 100 year wave height. And another way to think of the 100 year wave height is just it's a wave that has a 1% 1 1 chance of occurring in a given year. So in 100 years, you might expect one of them. So uh, in this example, so the 50-year storm, which corresponds to this return period of, of 50 years, or a 2% annual chance of occurrence is, is a little bit more than, than 2 meters. Or sorry, 10 meters. <clears throat> so this is what the... Uh, generalized extreme value distribution looks like. And you don't have to worry too much about the equation, uh, but essentially this is a complicated version of a, of a Gaussian bell curve. So it has a parameter representing the, the mean of that distribution, mu, the width of that distribution, sigma, and the skewness of that distribution, k. Okay? And um, those parameters have, have pretty interesting consequences on the behavior of extremes. And here I sort of identify the 50-year storm as sort of a critical threshold because uh, if you look in the Coastal Engineering Manual, there's, there's just this direct quote here that basically says that most coastal engineering <coughs> infrastructure is designed for return periods of 50 years or less. Um, the Dutch take a more conservative approach to their coastal engineering structures. They design structures for one in every 10,000-year event. But here we're a little more economical. Uh, unfortunately, as I'll talk a little bit about later in this talk, when most of these coastal infrastructure was, was designed, um, they didn't make an allowance, what's called an allowance for additional sea level, that it was designed with the assumption that sea level would remain as it is right now. They didn't make any necessarily additional factor or allowance for uh, future sea level rise, uh, unfortunately, in some cases. Okay, so this is, um, uh, we did a little um, study where we took global models for the tide, global models for storm surge, and global models for wave setup, combined them to, to generate what's called a total water level, which represents sort of an extreme uh, flood hazard level uh, around the world. And then we uh, looked at, fit a distribution to the, the, the top three uh, extreme water level events around the globe. Um, and we're, now we're looking at the different parameters involved uh, uh, at, at particular locations. The mean, the standard deviation, um, and the, the skewness. Um, so whenever I look at this um, diagram, even though I've looked at it a lot, um, uh, I kind of always find really new, interesting things to, to, to um, <clears throat> understand and relate from this diagram. So this, di this uh, parameter, which represents the mean of that distribution, looks very much like the um, amplitude of the largest tidal component, um, which is driven 
which is the M2 component, which is the lunar semi-diurnal component. So it's the component of the tide that's associated uh, with the orbit of the moon, which is almost the largest tidal component everywhere you go. So if you looked at the amplitude of the M2 tidal component, it would look almost identical to this, with a little bit of differences in the, the high latitudes, which a little bit of this red area is associated with waves. But this mean parameter looks very much like you'd expect as, as, as a high tide level. <coughs> so the parameter sigma represents sort of the, the variance of the extremes. And when you look at this, you can see very interesting things happening. Um, so the northern hemisphere, uh, Pacific and North Atlantic, show very strong interannual variability um, in water level. And this is really driven by the interannual variability of, of extratropical storms which generate waves. Um, in comparison, the tropics are much more consistent, much lower uh, in terms of wave activity and water level activity. And compared to the northern uh, high latitudes, the southern ocean is, is very much consistent in terms of its sort of uh, extratropical wave activity. Um, and finally, in the, the shape parameter, the behavior of, of, of this uh, form of the shape parameter, you see these hot spots in red, um, which are very much associated with, um, with uh, uh, tropical cyclones. So the, these are the hot spots for tri tropical cyclones around uh, the, the world, which um, show a very distinct behavior uh, in terms of the statistic, statistical occurrence of extremes. Um, so kind of a nice way to describe this. Um, this parameter is really driven by the tide. This parameter is really driven by extratropical activity. And this parameter is really driven by, by tropical storm activity. Um, OK, so now that we've um, investigated the statistics a little bit, uh, we're going to try to see what happens with sea level rise. So if you took this statistical model, this distribution in blue, or this distribution over here, and you didn't change the underlying behavior of the wave dynamics or the climate. All you did was take the mean, mean water level, and you increased it. Then essentially, you're taking this distribution, and in this case, you're, you're shifting that distribution um, uh, just right there to you see to the, to, to the right. Or you're taking this distribution, and you're shifting it up. And that's problematic because uh, if you remember when I was talking about an engineering design, you figure out what your 50-year water level is or your 100-year water level is. You put all your infrastructure there, and then your infrastructure remains fixed. But as you increase the mean of this distribution, it allows so that lesser and lesser storms can exceed that threshold. And so if you looked at, as you slowly shift um, sea level, um, slowly increases, and you look at the factor of increase from the baseline state to the future state, well, based on the generalized extreme value distribution, so I'm just taking this distribution, shifting it associated with sea level rise, and looking at sort of the factor of increase in events that exceed that threshold. Uh, well, those, the, frequency, the, the increase in frequency of those events uh, grows exponentially. Um, so it sort of, you can see, starts out slow, and then it slowly ramps up and ramps up and ramps up and, and gets pretty out of hand. Um, so that is the behavior based on the generalized extreme value statistical model. But we're going to try to take a different approach where rather than rely on a statistical model, we'll just use the empirical data and try to come up with an empirical estimate of, of this rate of growth uh, of, of flooding frequency associated with sea level rise. Uh, and that was an approach that I worked on with uh, a former graduate student, Mohsen Tarkhani, uh, and we're trying to get this work published uh, right now in scientific reports. So the data source that we used for this was uh, tide gauges. Um, so we also wanted to take a data-driven approach, use tide gauges rather than models. So NOAA has a really nice network of, of tide gauges that they serve uh, all around the US. So you can go to this nice website, NOAA Tides and Currents, and you can get historical data or predictions of what the water level is going to be almost anywhere around the US. And 
It has a really nice application programming interface. So if you use a URL with some of these keywords like the begin date or the end date, the station ID, the product, you can just go to this URL and it'll send you data. So we wrote a little code to uh, get a bunch of data um, from all the stations around the world and uh, try to analyze that. And now tide gauges are a little bit different um, situation because most of the tide gauges are really sheltered from impacts due to waves. And if you look at most of those areas, a lot of big population centers like Boston in particular, you have less exposure to waves, but there's more of an importance of tide and, and storm surge and things like that. So this analysis that I'll show is mostly focusing on water levels driven by um, tides, storm surge, but the impact of waves is a little bit more sheltered, which is characteristic of a lot of population centers where the wave exposure is relatively limited. So think San Francisco uh, and not, say, Ocean Beach, San Francisco. <clears throat> okay, so we analyzed um, this data uh, all around the U.S. And here I'm showing a little bit of these GEV parameters. And we performed a clustering analysis to try to identify particular groups or clusters that had a very consistent behavior. And this clustering was done on the GEV parameters, but interestingly, you see a very strong uh, latitudinal dependence of these clusters. So the red clusters uh, generally occur at low latitudes. The green clusters generally occur at mid-latitudes, and so the yellow clusters at, at mid-latitudes and the green clusters at high latitudes. And these blue clusters are very interesting. Those are tide gauge stations um, with high values of the, the shape parameter, which correspond to tide gauges that were really, uh, you see large tropical storm events um, in, in that data. Okay, so what we did with this data was this is an example for uh, Boston. We generate these return period curves. And then what we want to look at, we want to look at these two different scenarios. One is we want to find the difference between the 50-year water level event where the infrastructure is going to be designed and the, the water level event that's exceeded every year. And in Boston, that's about 30 centimeters um, of difference between those two scenarios. So if you took sea level and you raised it by 30 centimeters, then you'd exceed this 50-year threshold essentially every year. So the difference between the water levels is directly analogous to how much sea level rise you would need in order to, to have a regime shift from one scenario to the other. Uh, and likewise, we um, tried to find the water level difference between the 50-year water level event uh, and the mean high or high water, which is the high tide level that occurs every day. Uh, so you can see for Boston, the 50-year the water level event, which is sort of the extreme, is only about a meter difference from mean high or high water. So you can imagine a one meter sea level rise would cause your extreme level of all your infrastructure to be exceeded every day at high tide. So a pretty consequential uh, thing. So this is looking at for all of the tide gauge stations that we analyzed and with labels for a, 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 a few important uh, locations. The difference between the 50-year water level and the one-year water level event, and the difference between the 50-year water level event and the mean high or high water uh, tide gauge, tide level. Um, so looking for scenario one, for most stations around the U.S., the difference between the 50-year water level and the one-year water level is less than half a meter. Um, and maybe a little bit more scary, the difference between the 50-year water level and mean high or high water around the U.S. for most of the stations is, is less than 1.25 meters. So these values are really comparable to how much sea level rise we expect um, in the next uh, several decades. So if you uh, take this plot, and instead of looking at it in terms of um, the difference in water level, you apply a sea level curve with time and then try to ask, okay, well, when in the future is, is this scenario going to take place where the 50-year uh, flood regime uh, transitions to an annual flood regime. So now instead of looking at it with sea level rise, we look at on the y-axis is, is a year in the future. Um, <clears throat> and we see here that 
while 2100 is a very common um, time frame far away from now, uh, but that's used in sea level rise. Uh, and you can see here in this scenario number two that um, at about 90% of the tide stations in the US, they transition from, or they experience today's 50 year uh, extreme coastal flood. They will, they will experience that 50 year extreme coastal flood um, every day uh, at highest tide uh, before 2100. And you can see a, a lot of uh, stations transition even before 2050. These highly vulnerable sites, which are generally associated with low latitudes um, uh, in red here. So next we wanted to look at the, the, the growth rate in um, looking at the odds of exceeding um, the 50 year uh, water level, how that increases steadily with small amounts of sea level rise. And this is a sort of spaghetti diagram where each of these lines corresponds to a single tide gauge station. Okay? So for the most vulnerable sites, the odds of exceeding the 50 year threshold uh, essentially doubles almost with every centimeter of sea level rise that you have. And this is a, a doubling with every five centimeters of sea level rise and a doubling with every 25 centimeters of sea level rise. And if you keep this, this doubling scale as a parameter, you can take all of these uh, different uh, tide gauge stations and you can sort of collapse them onto this one relationship uh, which looks like this. So the odds of increased flooding at an extreme threshold um, look like two to the power of sea level rise divided by this doubling parameter. So for instance, say your doubling parameter was 10 centimeters of sea level rise. You have 20 centimeters of sea level rise. 20 divided by 10 is two. Two to the two is, is four. So you get a factor of four increase in sea level rise, which is two doubling periods. Um, and so you can imagine if, if you only have um, a doubling period or doubling amount of sea level as 10 centimeters of sea level rise and you have uh, one meter. So their doubling peri your doubling amount of sea level is 10 centimeters and your amount of sea level is one centimeter or, or sorry, one meter of sea level rise, then you'd essentially have 10, 10 doubling periods. So, so two to the 10, which is a factor of a thousand. So a pretty serious increase in uh, flooding. And taking the same approach, we can apply a sea level projection and we can look at rather than an amount of sea level rise that you'd need, uh, amount of time that you'd need to say double the odds of, of having extreme flooding. And looking at it in this way, uh, you see that well for different sea level projections which are shown here, but focusing on some of the more high end projections, um, you see that for the most vulnerable sites, the, the odds of exceeding three extreme flooding thresholds uh, doubles approximately every five years. Okay, so the summary of this section, getting back to uh, the relation to uh, the movie Point Break. Um, so the reason that this is related to the Point Break, if you can remember, is, um, well, this guy, Patrick Swayze, is a bank robber slash surfer. <laughs> And Keanu Reeves is an undercover FBI agent who pretends to be a surfer to go and catch him. <laughs> I, without trying to spoil too much of the movie, um, Keanu Reeves at the very end of the movie ends up catching Patrick Swayze because he because Keanu Reeves knows that Patrick Swayze is chasing the 50-year storm, <laughs> and so that that's where he knows where he's going to be. So he ends up catching him because because of the 50-year storm. So prominently featured in the movie. And an interesting fact about, about this is looking at the odds of this, well, you're going to have a lot more 50-year storms that ex ex exceed the extreme water level in the future. So that's the relation in that case to the movie Point Break. So a summary here is just the odds of exceeding the 50-year extreme water level event we're finding doubles approximately every five years due to sea level rise. Okay. The next section we're going to talk about is um, coastal erosion and uh, talking about a data assimilated model of coastal change in California and now think about uh, as I'm going through how this might relate to, to the movie True Lies. Okay. <clears throat> 
So California's uh, beaches and sediment supply. Most of the beaches in California get their sediment from three different sources. One is fluvial sediment input, which is sediment delivered from rivers. Here you see the, the Santa Clara River in Ventura, a satellite image of, of a ton of sand that's basically being dumped in the coast from, from the Santa Clara River. Uh, another source of sediment for California's beaches is from eroding cliffs and dunes. Uh, and another one, uh, particularly in highly developed areas like Southern California, a lot of the sand comes from artificial beach nourishments. Um, and this is a California-centric view of, of sediment supply, but if you go to a tropical setting, another big source of sand is from coral reefs. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so here's a few examples. Um, some really impressive examples of these different processes. Here's fluvial sediment, um, fluvial sediment plume that was delivered to the coastal area from the removal of the Elwha Dam in Washington. Just a huge signal of sediment being delivered from the coast, the sediment that was previously impounded by this dam. Uh, and if you remember a couple of years ago, um, the, the Big Sur landslide, so this is sort of the before shot, uh, and this is the after. So you can see like a lot of, of material was sort of delivered to the coastline. And I'm not sure if in several decades you're gonna have like a really nice beach here from all this stuff that was, was dumped there, but, but maybe. Um, interestingly, we have a guy in our office, um, John Warwick, um, who was really instrumental in um, monitoring both the Elwha and, and this landslide. So here's another really impressive uh, video of cliff erosion uh, in Pacifica. Um, and certainly you'd not want to uh, be living in, in these little condos <laughs> while this is going on. Um, I am almost positive that all of these structures have since been removed. <laughs> As you can imagine, they, they certainly need to be. Um, another, the, probably the most famous example of a beach nourishment uh, is this thing called the sand engine uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, and essentially, this is a big beach nourishment, was a, which was a, essentially a research project by the Dutch government. So what they did was they built out this gigantic little sand lobe um, as a way to thinking, well, maybe we should just nourish the beach in, in one location and then let it naturally spread down the coast rather than nourish the beach everywhere. So this thing is slowly spreading down the coast both ways and, and providing additional sand to these areas over here. So if you can get a scale of th this thing, this is, they built it out a kilometer um, from the existing shoreline and it's about three kilometers long, so it's pretty massive. Biggest, biggest nourishment project in the world by far. Um, okay, so those were um, sediment supply uh, processes, and now we're going to look at factors that contribute to erosion. Um, so one factor that contributes to erosion is, is waves, of course. Uh, another is sea level rise, uh, and also uh, river damming and shoreline armoring. Essentially, anything that's getting in the way of a natural sediment supply. For instance, say the river is is giving you a lot of fluvial sediment supply to your beaches. If you dam that river, reduce that sediment, well, the beaches are going to be affected. If those, eroding cliffs are, or if those eroding cliffs are providing sand to the beach, well, if you armor all those cliffs, you're going to reduce the sediment supply from the cliffs. And waves, of course, um, move everything around. <clears throat> so looking at the wave-driven components in particular, <clears throat> so for wave-driven transport, you essentially have what's called longshore transport. So transport from one area of the beach, beach sand over here, to in a different location. So here's just a little example of longshore uh, sand transport. So here there are a couple of um, idealized headlands. And the sand, the yellow sand here, essentially moves um, in concert with a wave angle. So when the waves are coming from more of the north, it pushes sand on one side of the headland, and when the waves are coming more from the south, it pushes sand on the other side of the headland. So that's essentially longshore transport. Uh, another uh, transport mechanism is called uh, cross-shore transport, which is also called equilibrium uh, shoreline uh, transport or equilibrium shoreline change. And essentially the behavior of, 
of that process uh, looks like this, where you have <coughs> a normal beach profile, where you have some dunes, and you have a beach, and you have sort of small waves. When the waves become larger, uh, it erodes sand from the, the dry beach and deposits that offshore. So the beach profile is becoming more into equilibrium with a large wave state, which favors having big sandbars that dissipate uh, uh, wave energy uh, more offshore. <coughs> and when the waves get a little bit smaller, uh, it favors onshore transport and the building of that beach back out. So if you go to the beach in California, that's probably going to be the, the biggest seasonal change that you're going to see is erosion of the beach in the wintertime when the waves are big, and then that beach will slowly be built out when the waves are a little bit smaller. Okay, now sea level rise. So <coughs> sea level rise um, uh, changes uh, beaches in, in a particular way that was um, uh, first sort of uh, uh, des described by um, uh, Brun, so it's called the Brun Rule. And the idea behind this is that the beach maintains an equilibrium profile or shape, so this shape. It, it the beach wants to keep that shape to be the same. And so as, as sea level rise, uh, as sea level goes up, uh, it wants to maintain this same beach profile at a, at a higher elevation. So the consequences of that generally is you have erosion from the dry beach and deposition offshore. So the whole profile migrates both upward due to sea level rise, but also landward. <clears throat> okay, there are a variety of different models uh, to predict shoreline change. Um, <clears throat> one approach that you can imagine, uh, which is a very nice approach, which is a physics-based numerical models. They essentially solve conservation of mass and momentum of fluid, being water, and sediment. And so they can, they can move it around uh, in different ways. Uh, very much like a model that predicts the weather or a model that predicts uh, behavior of the ocean. So there are more simplified approaches, which are called data-driven approaches or process-based models, where they don't try to directly simulate the, the physics of the model, but they try to represent um, processes with data or in a much more simplified way. Uh, and one uh, nice example of, the, of this approach is, is the USGS National Assessment of Shoreline Change. So the USGS National Assessment of Shoreline Change was a very large uh, project where they tried to determine long-term rates of shoreline change uh, around the entire United States. And the concept behind this was, okay, if you have a bunch of <coughs> aerial photos going back in time, well, you can digitize the location of the shoreline uh, for each of those photos, and then you can, based on those little shape files, you can fit a relationship to see how they might change over time. So for a given location, you generate these little spaghetti lines, which represent a shoreline, at a given time, you can shoot some transects through it, and you can look at the long-term change of the shoreline position on that transect over time. And so this was the approach for the USGS National Assessment of Shoreline Change. Uh, it's a very nice way uh, to look at long-term shoreline change, but there are some drawbacks. One drawback is that if you only have a limited amount of data, uh, limited amount of shoreline photos, some of those photos can have large erosion events or accretion events or, or different things happening. The shorelines can be highly variable, so depending on when that photo was taken, you can have uh, different behavior. So some colleagues that I've worked with um, when I was at the University of Hawaii have come up with ways of improving that, which has sort of been uh, really important to, to uh, un improving my understanding of the problem. Um, so if you wanted to come up with a, a better long-term rate, you have to account for these short-term variability due to storms. And finally, if you, if you want to address things like long-term sea level rise, well, that's going to inevitably accelerate the erosion that's going to be happening. So if you're looking at past data and trends, well, those probably will, will accelerate due to sea level rise. Because during this period, sea level rise was very minimal. But as you get to 
higher and higher sea level projections going far farther into the future, um, you can see a lot more, a lot more sea level in the future period than you saw in the past. So another really nice um, method um, uh, was developed by um, Joe Long and Nathaniel Plant, um, who were at, at the time were at the USGS uh, in St. Petersburg. Um, they developed this model that combines a model for a long-term erosion combined with a wave-driven short-term equilibrium model. And they combine these two techniques with a method called data assimilation. And data assimilation is just a way where you can combine uh, some type of forward model with data to sort of calibrate the behavior to an individual location. Uh, and interestingly, um, data assimilation is, um, is maybe the primary um, technique that was developed to really improve simulation of weather. So the reason that you probably believe your, your weather forecast is not only because the models are good, but the models use a lot of data collected all over the place. And that, that data assimilation piece has really improved the predictability of the weather. So in case of sediment transport, uh, these guys had the great idea of, well, let's use data assimilation to try to improve our predictive capabilities of shoreline change. So we took that approach uh, and we tried to develop a, a little bit further and apply it to Southern California. Um, so here is just an example of a model that we developed for about 500 kilometers uh, of coastal area in uh, Southern California. The model that we developed includes longshore sediment transport, cross-shore sediment transport, the effects of sea level rise and sediment supply from natural and anthropogenic sources. Uh, and it uses data assimilation to estimate some of the parameters that are involved. Uh, so I don't want to get too much into the details of, of the equation, uh, but essentially the model uh, looks at, uh, solves a differential equation which looks at the, the rate of shoreline change uh, why is the shoreline position, but it's driven by gradients in longshore sediment transport, uh, cross-shore um, uh, shoreline change due to waves and due to sea level rise. Uh, this is a model that was developed by some folks at Scripps. This is a model that looks like the Brun rule. And this is a, a residual term that sort of represents everything that we're not resolving in these dynamical terms, which we estimate from uh, data assimilation. And if you cross off these dynamical terms, if you just had this piece and this piece, well, that looks very much like the USGS National Assessment of Shoreline Change. And we wanted to improve upon that by adding some more dynamical processes the, related to waves and sea level. And so we use data assimilation. And the data uh, generally comes from LIDAR surveys. Uh, LIDAR surveys is you have a plane and you have a plane that flies over with a laser, and that laser records basically the elevation uh, all of, of the whole coastal area. So the USGS you know, digital elevation models are, are a very important product, and we're very fortunate to have a number of, of LIDAR surveys uh, that are essentially twice a year going back uh, pretty far to really uh, assess uh, coastal change in a, in, a, in a highly accurate way. So we're, we're lucky that the application was Southern California where, where all this data exists. So each of these spaghetti lines represents, say, the mean high water contour on that elevation model uh, at a particular time. And so the model works by, well, the intersection of those spaghetti shorelines and an individual transect basically gives you uh, these blue dots which are the observational data. And the model takes wave height and wave direction and period and produces a prediction of how the shoreline evolves, um, which you can see here is generally looks like, well, whenever you have big waves, you have a lot of erosion. Whenever you have small waves, you have a lot of accretion. But as the model runs, whenever there's um, a time where you have both a model prediction and you have a data point, it uses that opportunity to adjust the model parameters to best calibrate uh, the behavior for that particular location of interest. So this is essentially uh, a data assimilation process applied to this model. And so <clears throat> once you come up with a good parameter estimate for your particular location of interest, you can run that model in a forecast mode and try to predict 
what might happen on a particular uh, sec section of beach. <clears throat> so this is a section of, of beach uh, in La Jolla. This is Scripps Pier. Uh, and you can see the <clears throat> lines here correspond to the initial shoreline position in green, the final shoreline predicted uh, shoreline position in red with an uncertainty band in yellow, and another uncertainty band associated with a, a year of particularly large waves which would cause additional erosion. And for many locations, uh, as you run this model to 2100, um, they sort of look like this section in the, in the bottom here, where essentially you have the predicted shoreline position is right at the edge of the infrastructure. So in this simulation right here, the, the beach is entirely gone. Okay? So if you uh, look at that across the whole section of California coastline, you run that to 2100, you'll find that about uh, one-third to about two-thirds of the beaches in Southern California become completely eroded by 2100 under these sea level rise scenarios, so, so completely gone. So this finding was uh, prominently featured in California's fourth climate change assessment, um, um, where, you know, warning that, you know, losing two-thirds of the beaches in California could, could certainly make the, the, the place um, um, very different. <laughs> okay, so getting back to a summary and my connection to the movie True Lies, so think in your mind about how that might connect, okay? So this section was talking about a, a data assimilated model of coastal change in California. And there's a real famous quote that I think might uh, illustrate <laughs> why um, uh, I think we're getting towards the movie True Lies. So there's this famous quote from a real famous mathematician, uh, George Box, that says that all models are wrong, some models are useful. <laughs> and the essence of this quote is essentially that the California coastline is far more complex than my little model can possibly hope to resolve. So it's making a lot of assumptions and a lot of approximations, but we're really trying to capture the most important processes and we're trying to use data to improve that as much as we can. So although the model is not right, um, it can have some aspects of it where we really learn more about the system um, through that whole exercise. So getting to the title True Lies, so if you see here, data assimilated model, well to me essentially uh, that's true lies. <laughs> <laughs> and you also might think that, okay, well maybe this section might relate to the movie True Lies uh, because it's looking at coastal change in California um, and as governor of California, um, Arnold Schwarzenegger um, you know, fought to address climate change very much like in the movie True Lies, he fought terrorists. <laughs> so I think it might be a, a nice tribute um, to, to his actions as the governor of California. Um, so that essentially includes, concludes my talk. I'll just give you a, a few summary points. Um, so how bad could it possibly be? Well, if sea level rise projections hold, um, then we're going to have some pretty serious consequences. Today's 50-year water levels uh, may be exceeded every high tide before 2100. And the odds of exceeding extreme uh, flood thresholds due to sea level rise uh, will double approximately every five years going forward into the future. Modeling coastal change is still very hard, uh, but data assimilation and the acquisition of more and more data is really starting to enable us to achieve reliable quantitative predictions uh, in a very complicated system. Uh, and that is basically what I'm going to continue to work on uh, at the USGS and, and hopefully have uh, better predictions of, of what might happen to the beaches. Uh, so that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. So if you'd like to ask a question, we ask that you please step up to the microphone and Sean will be thrilled to answer your question. Okay, it's been a long time since I had calculus or anything <laughs> other than measuring and stuff. So a lot of that went way over my head. However, um, 
the big question I have is you had that map down there by La Jolla. Mm -hmm. Are there maps available for other coastline areas of California that show the same thing or show? <clears throat> yes. Yeah, so, um, so as part of um, a project called the Coastal Storm Modeling System, uh, we finished um, Southern California. Um, I've also finished the modeling results for Central California, which go from Point Conception to um, uh, the Golden Gate. Um, the shoreline projections are done for that. There's, there's a, accompanying flooding projections associated with those coastal change and storm scenarios which are being finished right now. Those should be available uh, very soon. And then now we're going to be working on Northern California. Uh, we've also got some Hurricane uh, Florence supplemental funding to try to make these projections on the East Coast, so we're starting to get over in that location. I can give you a specific website, or if you Google uh, Our Coast, Our Future, you'll have access to all of those projections for, for both flooding <coughs> and uh, coastal change. So it's Our Coast, Our Future, and I can give you specifically where you'd want to go to look at that. But it is available. Uh, my name is Chuck Hackerine, and I'm long time retired from the Electric Power Research Institute, where I managed research on this and other areas. Could you comment on the influences, perhaps not in California, but other regions you study, of groundwater extraction in coastal regions and isostatic rebound of uh, the land masses in glacial regions on sea level rise? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so. Um, very important processes. Most of the processes that I focused on have to do with sort of the, the global average of sea level rise, more water being added to the system. But like you mentioned, there's an extremely important component which I didn't talk about, which is the tectonics. Okay? So if you look at, uh, for, in, for instance, areas on the East Coast, particularly in the Gulf Coast, like New Orleans, although global sea level rise is rising at about three or four centimeters per year, you look at tide gauges in New Orleans and it's almost one centimeter per year. So triple, triple the global average. And that is a combination of a little bit of sea level rise and a lot of subsidence. So groundwater extraction can certainly contribute to that. Um, but the subsidence of that whole delta, just because it's, it's sinking, is, is also a, a pretty important factor. And, and rebound. Rebound is another really important thing. Uh, ironically, um, for areas in Greenland, where you think you might get a lot of sea level rise because, well, the water's melting right there, you have a process called rebound. So all that ice mass is melting, so that whole thing weighs less now. So you're not going to have sea level rise in an area like Greenland, you're going to have sea level fall. So there's this interesting process called sea level fingerprinting by based on where the ice is melting and how the, 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 the crust is rebounding, you might have little localized hot spots of higher amounts of sea level rise. <clears throat> uh, in particular, low latitude areas like in Hawaii are, are really particularly hit uh, very bad. So all those tectonic uh, processes, which are extremely important to the US Geological Survey, are very important to, to consider. So, so thank you for your comment on that. <clears throat> Uh, your 280 million people displaced uh, by 2100 versus what I saw happening in California. California doesn't look that bad, so we lose the Southern California beaches. I assume yep. that's Florida and yep. Bangladesh and places like that. Can yep. you speak to a little more global distribution? Well, where, where those things are, I think exactly like you're, like you're talking about, they're, <clears throat> they're low-lying estuaries. Um, so. You know, Bangladesh, um, you know, Mumbai, um, some low-lying areas in China are hit very, very hard. Um, we're not hit nearly as hard as they are. Another uh, real important area is low-lying Pacific Island atolls. Many of them don't have very large populations, but they're going to be hit particularly hard uh, because of these processes. Um, in California, we're going to lose beaches and we're going to lose property and we're going to try to make solutions, but, but we're not the ones that are going to be hit the hardest. <laughs> I would say the people that are going to be hit the hardest are the low-lying Pacific Island nations where, where their country might be underwater. <laughs> Florida is going to be hit pretty hard, absolutely. Um, you know, they, 
they're going to be doing a lot of nourishing and a lot of pumping, um, but absolutely Florida is going to be hit uh, much harder than California, for instance. You know, California, or sorry, Florida and New Jersey spend the most amount of money on beach nourishments, and that certainly will continue to try to preserve sort of the infrastructure there. Yeah. Um, in one of your first slides, uh, you had the, the variation in sea level back going back yep. uh, half a million years or so. Mm -hmm. um, there were two, two, two things about that that was, struck me. One is that the sea level rise after the, uh, after the glacial periods is much faster than sea level fall yeah. when, it's, when it's starting. Mm -hmm. And the second is that the, that the peak has always ended up being around zero where we are today, yep. and never got much higher yep. than that. Even though we still have a lot of uh, a lot of mm -hmm. uh, 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 ice surface on the ocean uh, on the planet now, is it likely that even more? Uh, okay, yeah, that one. Oh, things over. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. So, like you were saying, there's um, some pretty interesting sea level high stands here. Um, so you have these low stands associated with these glacial periods, but you also have these high stands. Uh, and these are about 10 meters higher than present. So um, partially associated with you know, more ice being melted than there is ice right now. Um, but we think we're going to go way past that. I couldn't specifically tell you what are the geologic reasons why the high stand uh, looks particularly at this level, uh, but that's a very important thing to sort of note that it sort of peaks around this level with these these little high stands. I think just sort of in it's just an equilibrium concept of you know the 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 position of the 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 sun and the earth in their orbit are just such that this is about the the maximum sea level uh, that we're sort of getting, um, but. The projections are, well, right now we're probably a little bit below these high stands. I think these are around 10 meters. So we could, but you can see sometimes those high stands have been reached during the interglacials and sometimes they haven't. Um, so we're, right now we're sort of over in the, in the orbital cycle, we're sort of, should be over that hump and going back down, um, but we're not seeing that. And CO, CO2? CO2. Years ago, people were predicting a new ice age. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the speed at which they go up, that's another thing. Yep. Yeah, the speed at which they go up, I, I believe, is, is, is entirely related to the orbital motions, that the, or, the orbital sort of precession of the Earth will describe this behavior of rapid rise and then a, then a slow decline. Milankovitch cycles, I believe, will describe that. Question? Yeah, I was looking at your uh, model results where you, you take your data and you, and you work with the data until mm -hmm. you run out, and then you just have a model result. And I noticed that <clears throat> when you have data, you have this really large dynamic range. You have uh, rebuilding, and then you have uh, yep. erosion. And that dynamic range totally evaporates when you run out of yeah, data. Yeah. And so um, I'm curious if you could speak to that, to yeah, yeah. how you feel about this model based on that uh, Absolutely. No, that's an extremely important thing. And the, the problem with that that you um, totally saw in this is related to this end period. That actually, <clears throat> uh, let's see here, this behavior, right, where there's not as much yeah, variability right. Right in this portion. Line, uh -huh. Unfortunately, um, that is not related to the behavior of the model parameters. That is entirely related to the fact that we're terrible at forecasting waves <laughs> in contrast to hindcasting. <coughs> the variance of this hindcast is extremely low compared to the historical period. So that's really what's driving the limited variance. So this you is say a, it's this more like an average? Yeah. And so maybe, maybe an accurate average, but more like an yeah. average that doesn't capture the entire range. This uh, behavior improves vastly as you go um, beyond this initial transition from hindcast to forecast, the variance of the wave height imp improves much better to a realistic range as you go longer into the, into the future. But unfortunately, the, in this case, the forecast is, is not very good for the <laughs> waves. And that's really what's driving the behavior. Mm -hmm. um, so this is something that we've sort of, 
I've really been looking at in the future. Um, if I can skip ahead a little bit, um, my computer's not quite catching up with me here. Um, but that behavior is something that we're, we're very, very much interested in, trying to understand, okay, well, if we're trying to make a future prediction of, of how the system is going to behave, um, and we're trying to make a prediction in the future, well, we really need to know what the waves are going to be like. And you don't always know what the waves are going to be like in the future. Um, so we've tried to do these different scenarios where, well, instead of running <coughs> known wave conditions, we try to run an ensemble of potential future wave conditions. And you can see in this case, well, the, the variability of the, the modeled shoreline condition with a uniform forcing and with an ensemble forcing, which is a, a hundred different possible combinations of what the waves might be, uh, can look very different. Mm -hmm. So that's an extremely important thing that we're trying to look at in the future is how can we come up with the best wave projections and not just use a single wave projection but a whole range mm -hmm. of projections to try to, to understand the variability of the shoreline as a consequence of the waves. Mm -hmm. So thank you for noticing that. <laughs> yeah, a very important thing. Yeah, can I ask a bonus question? Yeah, please. Uh, can, you, can you speak to, um, I know this isn't really your wheelhouse, but mm -hmm. what do you, I just say, what do you think we should do about it? <laughs> <laughs> so what, what, what should we do about it? <laughs> Wait, can I actually uh, just add to that? Yeah, um, please. Just related, uh, what, are, what are your thoughts on armament versus nourishment, since that's mm -hmm. in the what do you do about it category? Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> at the end of the day, it really comes down to sea level rise. The, all of coastal hazards uh, ultimately are linked with what is global sea level rise in the future. If we get a half a meter of sea level rise, we're going to be really lucky <laughs> by 2100. If we get two and a half meters of sea level rise, well, we might not be that unlucky, but we'll be pretty unlucky. If you get more than two and a half meters of sea level rise, we're going to be really unlucky. But even with two meters of sea level rise, we're going to be really unlucky. So the best thing to do about it would be to reduce carbon emissions and pray that sea level rise is not going to get as high as it will. Um, but as we're getting more down the line of really high carbon emissions, if, if we're locked into that scenario where we're going to get two meters of sea level rise, well, essentially, we're going we're gonna to do what, what the Dutch do um, because their whole country is pretty much you know, under sea level. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to build walls. We're either going to build walls out of concrete or we're going to build walls out of sand. Either way, they're, they're building walls. And we're going to pump. You know, we're we're going to pump a lot because those walls might not necessarily stop um, the groundwater, you know, higher water table from coming in through the groundwater. So the way that you solve that problem is by pumping. So that you're constantly pumping, dumping that water into the ocean, it comes back, you, you pump it out. <laughs> because the groundwater, the movement of, of water through the groundwater um, is so much slower, right? You, you can do that process of, of continuously pumping even though it wants to come back. Um, so in a place like the Netherlands, they have the material to do those large beach nourishments. On the East Coast, they have the material to do those large beach nourishments, and we're going to continue to do those beach nourishments. On the West Coast, uh, we could probably find the material to do large beach nourishments, and I think that's probably what we will do. Um, but you know, there are a lot of areas where they're marine protected, so you're not necessarily allowed to do beach nourishments in those areas. So that might be a, a particular challenge in those certain areas where you essentially can't do uh, beach nourishments. Um, so. I mean, that's what I think we're going to do, is, is be building a lot of walls out of sand, out of concrete, and doing a lot of pumping. Um, you know, I think sea level rise and coastal engineering is, is very much a growth industry. So <laughs> if you have kids that are going to college, then encourage them to uh, work on this. And plumbing, plumbers. Yeah. We're going to need a lot more plumbers in the future, so. <laughs> so thanks. Would you go back to the uh, introductory picture yeah. with that um, uh, exciting wave coming in? Mm -hmm. All right. 
This one? Yeah. Is, and is that a hundred year wait? That's, that's uh, exciting. I mean, yeah, very uh, exciting, right? Well, this, this, is, um, this is an El Nino year. 2015, 2016 was a, was a rather large El Nino year. We had 82, 83, 97, 98, 2015, 2016. So I couldn't exactly tell you, you know, if this is, this is a 50 year wave or this is a hundred year wave, but no doubt, um, you know, if they designed the pier, <laughs> you know, which they did. Somebody designed the pier so that it's going to be situated above the 50 or 100 year wave. Uh, and you can see, well, you know, not quite large enough. Whether that's sea level rise or from experiencing a larger than 50 year wave, could be one or the other. But I'm guessing that, you know, this wave is, is probably very close to the design condition for that, for that, for that pier. <laughs> yeah, the flag is on the end of the pier. Yeah, so this, this pier keeps going. Yeah, keeps going. You can't see the end of it, but this is on the end of the pier. Yeah. <laughs> so, pretty impressive picture. On, on the groundwater that you're going to pump out, um, mm -hmm. is, is the salt going to cause troubles? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> so ag agriculture, I would say, is the main impact. Um, of course, drinking water is another, another big impact. Uh, a guy at our office, Kurt Sorlazzi, has done a lot of, and, and Cliff Voss uh, here at, at the USGS has done a lot of interesting work on, on trying to understand, associated with sea level rise, you have that saltwater intrusion. You also have flooding, you know, flooding uh, from that saltwater, um, but also groundwater intrusion that can affect agriculture. And, um, and drinking water supply. And they're basically showing that because of sea level rise and those processes, you may have some, some atolls in the Pacific that are essentially uninhabitable in the next few decades because of those processes. So pretty important. Salinas Valley is also an area that, that might be a, a, an interesting um, thing going on where there's a lot of agriculture there. And you know, as they pump, the salt water table wants to come in. As sea level goes up, the water wants to come in. So interesting to see what, what, what would happen there. Second round of question. Yep. I've heard that there's a differential between what's happening in the Atlantic, the east coast of the United States versus the west coast of the United States and the Pacific in terms of sea level rise. That's the first part of the question. The other is I didn't see anything in your sea level predictions that accounts for thermal expansion of the water. Yeah. So thermal expansion is, is all um, uh, included in these projections. Uh, very fortunately, um, thermal expansion is sort of the, the easiest part to project um, because you have a temperature projection, you can make a calculation of the volumetric expansion, that gives you the amount of sea level rise. So that's kind of the, the easy part. And so those projections really go into um, uh, these uh, scenarios here. Uh, and if you look at historical sea level rise, uh, in the past, they've, they've done these nice studies where, where the sea level rise that we have gotten, 50% of it comes from thermal expansion, 50% comes from um, eustatic sea level, which is you're adding more water. Um, but the uncertainty going forward into the future is all driven by the eustatic part, almost all of it. Uh, and then going back to your other comment about uh, east coast versus west coast, um, well, the big difference between East Coast and West Coast gets back to the tectonics on sort of an obvious level. If you look at the tide gauges around here, um, <clears throat> uh, Monterey tide gauges going up at about one millimeter per year. So not as much. And the reason that it's only going up at one millimeter per year is, well, say you're getting three centimeters of sea level rise, but the tectonic area around here is uplifting at about two millimeters, so you only get one meter, one, one millimeter per year. San Francisco is going up at about two millimeters per year, so maybe you have about one millimeter of uplift. Um, the East Coast, it's, it's swinging the other way. You know, it's subsiding, so you have very high localized relative rates, rates of sea level rise. If you look at a, at a plot of the rate of sea level rise predicted from satellites, um, the East Coast is like so nice and predictable at about three millimeters per year. 
the West Coast is all over the place because you have these really big patterns associated with uh, El Nino where you have the whole water in the basin sort of sloshing back and forth. And, and that behavior can completely offset the amount of sea level rise that you'd be getting over decades at the current rate. So it's much harder to detect sea level in the Pacific than it is in the Atlantic. But again, in the East Coast, it's, it's so much dominated by the subsidence. And that's certainly going to continue. There are also a lot of interesting uh, properties about the Gulf Stream. The, the acceleration, the relaxation of the Gulf Stream, which can sort of cause local variations in sea level. And it would be very interesting to see what happens with the Gulf Stream. Another thing about the East Coast, which um, I've taken kind of a California, Hawaii centric view of things, um, but the East Coast is really dominated by hurricanes. Those are the most important hazards by far. And, you know, with climate change, we think that those processes are going to be sort of accelerating. The extratropical patterns in the North Pacific that are causing large waves and extreme flooding events, uh, for most climate ensembles for wave models, which uh, I'm working on a little bit right now uh, with some collaborators um, in Australia, um, those extratropical patterns in the north, northern hemisphere look like they're actually going down a little bit with, with climate. Not very much, but going down a little bit. So kind of an interesting behavior. The Southern Ocean is really ramping up with, with CO2 and with climate. So it's going to be a very, very interesting coastal hazard picture uh, down under. And also on the East Coast with what the climate might do to hurricane storm tracks. So a, a very big difference between the West Coast and the East Coast, the hurricane hazard. I'm glad you only took this up to the year 2100. <laughs> but if you look back uh, in historical terms, in 100,000 years, we'll be up 100 meters, not 10 meters. Oh, yeah? What's going to happen then? <laughs> Who knows? Yeah, I mean, if you look at some of the, the climate projections sort of in the, in the long term, um, a lot of the climate models show there's not a ton of um, ice in, in these big land masses uh, as you look very, very long into the future with high-end sea level projections. So in those cases where if those things really come true, you know, we're, we're looking at about, you know, say, I don't know, 10% of this melted, 7 meters of sea level rise, 10% plus of this, 1 meter, you know, we're looking at about 8 meters of sea level rise in the next 300 years or something like that. And that is kind of about, about the, the, the upper range of, well, no, I mean, it could, it could keep going. <laughs> but, you know, yeah. It would be worse than 100 meters. Yeah, it, it, we, you know, this is, this is what we would, you know, if we could somehow accelerate our transition, you know, this, <laughs> go back down to minus 100 meters, you know, we'd have a lot more coastal property that we could sell, <laughs> right? So, <laughs> um, but, but, you know, that, that is going to be sort of a, you know, interesting uh, potential thing is like, what, what are going to be the solutions to these things? Generally speaking, the, the cheapest option um, for all this is what solar geoengineering. I don't know if you've ever heard of what that is. Uh, but solar geoengineering um, is essentially you're spraying aerosol particles in the atmosphere to increase reflection. <laughs> and that, you know, may help you from, you know, global warming and things like that, but who knows what, what that's going to do to the climate. So, um, you know, it would be pretty scary if, if we're on the trajectory where our only option sort of out of climate change is, is some pretty drastic solutions like like solar geoengineering. Carbon geoengineering is also potentially another very, very interesting solution that hopefully we do more and more, which is um, we actively remove CO2 from the atmosphere. You suck it out and you inject it into these, these deep saline wells. And, and um, I'm sure tons of folks at the USGS have really looked at that a lot. And it seems like a fairly interesting proposition to 
reduce greenhouse gases while still, still relying on fossil fuels and, and emissions and that sort of energy sector and things like that. You could, you could be sort of carbon neutral in the atmosphere because you're sucking it out. Kind of the concept of, of you know, the Dutch where, right, you just, you just pump, pump, pump the water. Like if the water's getting too high, just pump it out. <laughs> That's carbon geoengineering, but we may, we may get down that road. We'll see. Could, could you say more about sea level? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, if, how, how, do you, how do you measure it? I mean, if the, if the east coast is sinking and the west coast is rising, mm -hmm. how do you know maybe the whole thing is, is sinking or rising you know, faster? I don't, I, yeah, so um, I haven't seen this data set yet, but NASA is producing, I think, a pretty cool data set which is vertical land motion for all the way around the US, maybe potentially around the world. The best way to um, really keep track of it is if you have a tide gauge, which is sort of measuring the water level, but you also have a, a nice GPS. So you can really get a, an absolute sense of how the sea level is, is rising. If that, that GPS is sinking over time, you can, you can assess that, oh, it's not the GPS position is stable and sea level is rising, but you actually are detecting an absolute O that's actually sinking. So the, the, to measure all these things, it's a combination of, of GPS stations and satellite altimetry and sea level stations and a lot of interesting stuff. Definitely um, not in entirely my field, but they, um, they do a lot of really interesting stuff to, to really assess, you know, is it subsidence? Is it sea level rise? Which one it is? And they, they can usually do a very good job of assessing how much is associated with subsidence, how much is associated with actual rise in sea level. So I think that problem is, is usually well solved. The more active GPS stations we put on tide gauges, the easier it will be to address that problem. Only a few stations have those. But where, how do the GPS guys know where they're standing? <laughs> <laughs> Relative to all the other GPSs and all the other cool sensors that they, they have out there, they can, they can really come up with a really nice sort of baseline of, of how these things evolve. But it's a very, very complicated process about how these things evolve over time. Well, thank you, Sean. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> and thank, thank you all for coming. I hope to see you January 23rd, 2020. <laughs>